Our New Zealand road trip really takes off. Where is Miss Nissy taking us? Many of New Zealand's hiking tracks run through nature reserves that are protected by the Department of Conservation. As we experience ourselves, nature thrives here, while visitors learn to appreciate nature's beauty. We are at the Pinnacles Hut. And we're going to make our way up to the Pinnacles on the Coromandel Peninsula. We made it to the top. We spend the night at the Freedom Campsite. They are free of charge and often in stunning places. The next day we visit Agrisi, a family business in Paeroa. They use washed up seaweed and turn it into a biostimulant for the soil and plants. Farmers who use Agrisi's seaweed products can drastically reduce synthetic fertilizer use. Company director Claire Bradley explains. So farmers uh, generally put on, especially in New Zealand, quite high amounts of um, artificial fertilizers. We're becoming um, acutely aware of the negative effects of um, excess nitrogen in our waterways, excess phosphorus. It's not only bad for the environment, but it's, it's bad economically for the farmer as well. Um, we do have a lot of regulations coming down, um, which mean that farmers are going to have to start coming up with new ways to farm sustainably. So Agrisi really helps them on that journey because we're able to reduce um, synthetic fertilizer use by 25% in year one. And how Agriseed products allow farmers to do that is by restoring the relationships with the soil microbes and plant roots. So often when plants are used to being fed fertilizers, they've stopped their relationships or communication with the soil microbes. And by stimulating that relationship again, you're able to get plants that can access their own nitrogen and own phosphorus from the bank of, of stuff that's already in the soil. The benefits of using seaweed in agriculture extend beyond the first year and also have social aspects. Be sure to watch our video dedicated to seaweed to learn more about these and the process of turning seaweed into biostimulants. <music> Our road trip continues south, across the North Island, to our next stop, Rotorua. The city has visible British influences. But also a vibrant Maori culture. The area is also known for its geothermal activity. Sulfur hangs in the air all over town, and we often see hot steam escaping from the ground. Yet the skill and power of it only really become apparent when we visit Waimangu Volcanic Valley, a few kilometers out of town. The landscape here changed dramatically after a volcanic eruption in 1886, and traces of the heat just below ground are still clearly visible. Lakes of boiling hot water, steaming streams and colourful algae characterise the scenery. How different is the landscape just beyond the valley? Did a bomb go off here? No, it's a forestry plantation. These monocultures do not support biodiversity and exhaust the soil making them unsustainable. As you can see, logging is a very big industry in New Zealand, which might make sense if you see land as a resource. But what if you look at things differently? 
The answer comes as soon as we enter Teo Rivera. The native forest thrives here. On our campsite, all we hear is a stream and bird song. Freedom camping doesn't get much better than this. Lake Valcare Moana and go hiking. How come this area is so pristine? We are in an area which the indigenous people of New Zealand, the Maori, call Te Urevera, and they see this entire land as a living being, unique in the world. New Zealand has recognized that concept and by law given this area legal personality and rights. The land here is the home of the Tuoe, the local Maori tribe. At the visitor center, Holly Taylor explains why the legal recognition of Te Urewera is significant to them. It embraces our way of living, which means that we don't we don't own the land, we belong to it. We belong to it and we have a responsibility to care for her, to care for her. Mm. Giving rights to nature has more than symbolic value. It validates a radically different relationship between man and nature. That worldview holds that we treat nature with the utmost respect, do not pollute or destroy it, and do not take more than it can give us. The more countries and people adopt that worldview, the better our chances of passing nature on to future generations become. Learn more in our separate video on rights for nature. We continue our trip to Napier where a remarkable amount of Art Deco style buildings are testament to a massive reconstruction effort following a destructive earthquake in the 1930s. Napier doesn't only impress us with its architecture. It sits at a massive bay, at the far end of which we find a colony of gannets. We're thrilled to see them on land after many encounters at sea. The road continues over a green mountain pass until we reach the country's capital, Wellington. For once, we don't have to look for a campsite, as our friends Carrie and Dan have generously offered their apartment to us. We visit Sustainability Trust, a social enterprise that is committed to making daily life more sustainable. Director Georgie Ferrari gives us an extensive tour and explains that they function as a local recycling center, insulate houses, install heat pumps and sell sustainable products for everyday life in their eco shop. They even run a curtain bank and various community workshops to make the city greener. Not 
Not far from the city center, we visit eco sanctuary Zealandia. Thanks to its fence that keeps predators out, it is a safe haven for native wildlife. It doesn't take long before we spot rare birds. And the tuatara, an endemic reptile. And is that? Yes, the flightless kiwi, the national symbol of New Zealand, which has become rare in so many parts of the country. What a great way to finish the first leg of our New Zealand Capavan trip. If you like this video and want to see more, subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on social media, become our patron on Patreon, or subscribe to our email newsletter on our website.